This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm in the home of Richard Heinberg, the author of The Party's Over, Power Down, and The Oil Depletion Protocol. Thanks for having us. It's good to be with you, Jenea. Here we are at the end of May in 07, and I want to know what's hot on your mind. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big question. There's a yeah, lot going on yeah, in the energy world. Yeah, there's a lot world. going on in the energy world. Um, well, there's several things we could talk about. One is high gasoline prices. And that's happening right now. Right. But that happens every year about now, doesn't it? it? What's different? Is anything different? Well, um, we are at record prices, and uh, there haven't been any hurricanes yet. Uh, we're just at the beginning of the driving season, actually. And uh, gasoline in storage is at record lows. So there's, there are the conditions in place for uh, much higher prices as the season proceeds. And that, that I think, will get people's attention. Folks will, will be you know, railing at the oil companies and price gouging and, and all of these sorts of things. And then politicians will, will have to uh, uh, enact some legislation to you know, wrap the wrists of, of the oil companies and so on. All of that will accomplish absolutely nothing, actually, in terms of the real problem. And um, Nevertheless, uh, when, when gasoline prices go up, it's, it's actually a very good thing because it does get people's attention right. on energy right. supply. Right. What is the real cause then? If it's not, you know, the, energy, ener the gas companies playing games with us, mm -hmm. what is it? Well, there are a number of things going on. Um, uh, the refinery situation is, is a bit delicate. Um, the, the refiners are, are, are trying to work uh, at optimum levels, but they, they, they have had some downtime for, for maintenance. Uh, there, there was quite a lot of um, uh, repair work needed after Katrina mm -hmm. and Rita, and that's mostly been completed, but, but still there's, there's kind of a backlog in, in uh, gasoline in stock as a result of that. We're importing more gasoline now than ever before because demand is up. Uh, Americans are driving more, and there are more Americans. Right, right. With more cars, right. more more cars in the U.S. than than licensed drivers, and so. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so. Maybe it's cars who really live in America, and then the humans yeah, attend to them. Yeah, right? that's right. That's right. Um, so all of those things added together uh, mean that. You know, there are more people wanting to buy gasoline than there are people wanting to sell it, and, and therefore prices go up. And basically, this is a situation that's not going to go away. This is what mm -hmm. Americans have to really understand. This is not a temporary situation where the oil companies are, you know, doing something wrong, and once they get back in line, we'll all be able to motor away at $2 a gallon gasoline again. We'll never see $2 this a gallon slow, gasoline again. slow, or not, maybe not so slow, but slow incline. Absolutely. Gas prices. Do you think we'll see yeah. shortages? Uh, we may see shortages in localized regions uh, later this season. Uh, I think that's unlikely. Probably we'll just see very high prices. We'll probably hit $4 a gallon, uh, certainly in California, uh, this, uh, this season. We, it may get, possibly get up to $5 a gallon. Uh, depends, wow. depends on... If we have an active hurricane season in the Gulf, uh, then all bets are off. But again, this is, uh, this is something we have to get used to. Americans need to wake up and realize that cheap gasoline is not their birthright. We've been living in a fool's paradise for the last umpteen decades, and um, the amount of oil in the ground is limited, and uh, we're, we're, we're probably past the all-time uh, production peak for regular crude oil globally. In, in the world? Yeah. Uh, That's going to change everything. Yeah. Um, as a result of, of decreased demand or relatively flat demand, we've, we've been able to get by for the last two years 
with um, record high prices, but you know spikes in in the in the region of uh, sixty to seventy dollars. But that's not going to continue forever, uh, and unless in fact someone can come up with some enormous new supplies of crude within the next uh, few months or a couple of years, we are going to start uh, seeing actual shortages of, of oil on the market. I don't want to seem like an apologist for the uh, oil industry, far from it. I think you know, as they rack up record profits, there needs to be a way for that for money sure. to, to go into helping society to adjust uh, to make the energy transition toward renewables. Nevertheless, demonizing the oil companies is not going to solve this problem. Ultimately, it has to come back to us. We have to change our behavior. I find myself telling folks in emails that say, you know, who say, don't, don't buy from the gas companies on a particular day. I'm saying, mm -hmm. that's crazy. The only thing yeah. that will make a difference is if we all are using less all the time. Absolutely. Right. So that leads us to people looking for alternatives, because that's heated up this year, people looking for alternative fuels to gasoline, right. biodiesel, um, and ethanol. Mm -hmm. So... What's your take on all of that scene, yeah. the biofuels? Well, it's, it's a little bit complicated because folks who are collecting waste vegetable oil and turning it into biodiesel and running their cars, what can you say about that? It's, you know, it's, it's making a good use of what would otherwise be a waste product. Right. The problem is biofuels on an enormous scale, and particularly corn ethanol. Um, it's just a huge boondoggle for the, um, uh, the big... Uh, agribusiness companies like Archer Daniels Midland and, and others. Uh, the uh, folks in the Midwest in the corn states understand that this is a boom and bust cycle, that there's going to be a huge amount of money thrown their way and all kinds of ethanol plants will be built and farmers will grow an awful lot of corn. Uh, a, a number of people will make a lot of money in the process and at a certain point uh, everyone will, will realize that it was all a big mistake and it will all go away. They already know that. Oh, yes, absolutely. In Iowa, for example, um, more ethanol plants are being built right now than can be serviced by all the corn being grown in Iowa. Iowa is going to become a net corn importer in, in order to service all these corn plants. Well, of course, that's an absurdity. It's not going to happen. All of these plants aren't going to get built. And at a certain point, everyone's going to figure out that the amount of energy going into this process is more than they're getting out from the corn ethanol that they're producing. That's the point that I, I want to get to is, isn't the hope, I and mean, why aren't they building ethanol because it can replace gasoline or, sure. or a large measure. Yeah. But you're saying the energy that it takes to produce all the corn and process and da 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 da, da yeah. is, is we're not getting anything back or much? That's right, and moreover, the energy that we're using is in the form of natural gas to cook the corn mash and so on. And here we are in the middle of a natural gas, the beginning actually, I should say, of a natural gas crisis in North America. Natural gas production has been declining gradually for the last few years, and it's about to head into a, a kind of tailspin, terminal tailspin. We're not hearing about that one. No, of course we are. Well, we, heard, we were uh, three or four years ago, and then what happened was that natural gas prices went up sufficiently so as to uh, cause the big industrial users of natural gas just to jump ship and move overseas to where natural gas is cheaper. Uh -huh. So about 100 chemicals plants closed, about 100,000 jobs were lost in the chemicals industry. Dow Chemical is moving all of its operations overseas to where, again, where natural gas is cheaper. Um, the, about half of the American fertilizer industry is gone because they use natural gas as a feedstock. And so temporarily the problem solved, but at what expense? But the, the, the problem doesn't really go away. Right. Okay. As, as the production continues to decline, then, well, where does demand destruction hit next? And certainly the ethanol industry is going to be affected by higher natural gas oh, prices. Oh, sure. Yeah. So that's where you're going to say, at, some, at that point, we're going to say, we're not getting anything out of this. I that's mean, right. we're not a net return. Yeah, we'd be much better off using that natural gas directly as, as a fuel because it's the highest quality fuel we have. And cleaner. And clean and so on. But, unfortunately, it... It's, it's limited in quantity. It's a, it's a non-renewable resource, and we are running out. Well, there's always the hope, I think people have, that coal, we've got a lot of coal in, Cal in America, that we can, can we just um, then move to some way of using our coal as our energy source for electricity or to replace our gasoline. Mm -hmm. So you've written recently on that. Yeah, I've written a couple of articles recently on um, 
two recent European studies on global coal supply. And those studies came to really shocking conclusions. We've all assumed that the world has 150 years yeah, worth yeah. of coal. Which we, is, we can, we can the relax. World Coal Institute has been telling us that for years and so on. And the U.S. Department of Energy parrots the same, the same uh, story. But the, uh, uh, well, the first study that came out was from the Energy Watch Group in Germany, which reports to the German parliament. And what they did was they looked at the latest uh, reserves reports for coal from individual nations. Now, many nations have not updated their coal reserves figures for decades. And the ones that have, have updated them downward, and in some cases, dramatically so. Some countries have revised their coal reserves up to 90% lower. Wow, that's uh, dramatic. Right. So the, as a consequence of that, that 150 years really starts to shrink pretty dramatically. Then what they did in their study was to apply the the peaking principle. Uh, mm. Often mm. when we talk about uh, s supplies, we just say, well, uh, we, we talk about reserves to production ratios. In other words, if we continue using the resource at current rates, how long will it last? But of course, that's absurd. That's it's, not how it happens. That's not how it happens. What always happens is the rate of extraction increases as demand increases. And then there comes a point when it becomes impossible to continue to increase the rate of extraction. It peaks and then declines. Uh, that's going to happen with coal, inevitably. But nobody had really done that kind of peaking analysis before. So they applied that kind of methodology. And the result they got was likely global coal production peak in the range of 2020 to 2030. That's not even a hundred years, not even 15 No, we're talking years. 15, That's... 15 years from now, probably. And China, which is by far the world's largest coal consumer currently, is going to peak much sooner. Because they're using so much. They're, because they're using so much. Now, the U.S. Um, has the world's largest coal reserves. However, we've used up a lot of the highest quality coal. And coal is different from oil in this regard. With oil, there is some difference in you know, light sweet crude and heavy sour crude and so on. But the, the difference in resource quality with coal is much greater. So that um, high-grade anthracite, for example, may have an energy density that's five or six times as much mm -hmm. as low-grade lignite. So we're using up that anthracite, obviously, much faster than the low-grade coal. You go after the low-hanging yeah, sure, fruit sure, first. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. That makes sense. And so in the U.S., even though we're still continuing to increase the total amount of coal that we produce annually, because we're having to produce more and more of the lower quality stuff, the energy that we're getting from coal actually peaked back in 1999. Really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it's like one after the other. All of those and, fossil and the, fuels and the US, are... The U.S. has actually the U.S. has actually become a net coal importer. We're importing coal now from Canada. So, and as we are with natural gas, right? Not, and we're importing most of our oil. I mean, yes. So, right, right. I mean, we're in a vulnerable spot. Increasingly, so of course, yeah. What, wh since these are also forms that we could produce our electricity out of, what's right. what's our future here for electricity? Because yeah. I imagine it's a that's, good question. Yeah. Um, the peak oil discussion has been mostly about liquid fuels. And we've been describing it as a liquid fuels crisis. But it's really much more than that. Once we factor in natural gas, and here in California, where we're speaking, of course, uh, over half of our electricity is produced from natural right. gas. That's not true nationally, but it's, it's true in certain pockets around the country. But factor in natural gas and factor in coal, and what we're looking at is uh, a, a broad-scale energy crisis that will begin with oil and natural gas and then spread to coal and then uranium. Uranium supply is also going to peak well before 2050, even in the best-case scenario. Wow. So that adding in uh, our primary energy source, oil, secondary energy source, coal, third is natural gas, okay. fourth is nuclear, all of those together make up 93% of global energy supply. All of those are going to be declining well before the middle of the century and starting, in some cases, almost, uh, almost immediately. 93%. That right. means that we've got maybe 7% in renewables. 
Well, or, or right in in terms of uh, large scale uh, hydropower, right. most most of that, and, Dams, and then right. and then um, uh, biomass, people burning wood in their fireplaces, and, and so on. Right. So it, there's really no credible scenario, given the time scale and the enormity of the problem. There's no credible scenario in which we'll be able to simply replace all of that energy with some other form of energy like uh, wind or solar or something like that. We need to develop those alternatives, obviously, right, but right. what we're currently getting from wind and solar is a small fraction of 1% of our total energy supply, so it's not something we can, we can do in a few years. It's going to take an enormous concerted effort on the part of uh, all the world's nations to make this energy transition, and we're going to have to rely mostly on the strategy of conservation, of simply uh, reducing our energy demand and using the energy that we do use in as efficient a way as we possibly can. Do we have I, time even to, at the scale, I, that's, that's always what boggles me, is the scale yeah. of the whole world using this much energy. I mean, we're ready, for, a lot of people are ready for those hybrid electric vehicles, mm -hmm. and they aren't quite here uh, yet. The hybrid, uh, hybrid plug-in hybrids. Plug-in hybrids, right. Yeah. Um, or even electric vehicles that, right. that ha can have a longer range. So, well, what's the market share of hybrids right now? I mean, we, we, we already have uh, a couple of, of those, you know, right. uh, Honda and, uh, and Toyota are, are already making several models of hybrids, but what's, what's the market penetration? That's true. It's only, a, I don't know what it is, a few percent. A couple percent, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, and it takes, even if we were making all hybrids, it would take 15 years to change out the fleet for everybody to, to swap. We don't, yeah. and so here we're saying we don't think we have 15 years. Right, right. So, so it's it's an enormous problem, and it's ultimately going to come down to behavior change, which is what no politician wants to hear. Uh, people are going to have to adjust their expectations and their behavior. That's you know when I when I talk about this with folks and say. It's, it's relatively simple to conserve 60, 70, 80 percent off your electricity. You just have to change a lot of habits. Right. Um, perhaps not as easy to save that high a percentage off your gasoline, but it's going to mean working together here. Yeah. That's behavior. Yeah. Well, you can double the fuel efficiency of the average American car by adding a passenger. Simple answer. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. But that that kind of collective uh, change in our attitude, what, you're, what I would expect here is that's the big change that has to happen, right. is in our attitude. Yeah. Prices will help with that, yes. but it's not going to be enough and it's not going to happen fast enough in order to uh, enable this, this process to, to occur without enormous economic and, and social and political pain. Ultimately, we're going to be much better off if politicians grasp this dilemma by the horns and inform the public of what's actually going on and enlist them in a World War II scale of collective effort. Get everyone on board, the corporations, the, uh, the car companies, the yes. energy companies, uh, in, a, in a collective effort to basically re-engineer the American lifestyle. Has that... This year, this last year, climate change has really come to the to the surface. Certainly, mm -hmm. the inconvenient truth, and it's been the forum because of the Kyoto Protocols of a place where governments, not the U.S., mm -hmm. have been paying attention to energy. Certainly, the carbon emissions, which means also energy. Right. Have we got any signs of hope there? I mean, how do you see the the climate change peak oil well, dance going here? Uh, well. I'm very glad to see the attention that's been going to the problem of climate change. Of course, it's it's very worrisome to see the the evidence of uh, dramatic impacts on uh, the the polar ice caps and the species that are losing habitat and likelihood of humans losing habitat and stronger st all all of the laundry list of horrors that that climate uh, chaos is is going to unleash upon us. Uh, however, um, it, it seems to me that the, the, uh, the, the folks who are involved in the climate change discussion are missing a few things. Uh, frankly, it seems to me that the, 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 the energy shortage factor is, is being overlooked. 
the tendency of the climate change folks is to say, look, there's just enormous quantities of fossil fuels out there. If we burn all of them, it'll, it'll be a catastrophe, which is right. true. Right. And, uh, and, and to ignore the, the, the shortfalls of energy supply that are, that are looming out there. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big mistake because it actually could work very much to their advantage. Because sure. what's actually going to happen, most likely, is we'll get some governmental efforts to reduce carbon emissions, yeah. which will be costly and annoying. Uh, and then energy supply shortfalls will start to happen. Energy prices will start to rise. That will bite into economic growth. and countries will take those efforts at uh, reducing carbon emissions and toss them overboard in an effort to keep their economic activity going. The economic pain from high energy prices could easily be sufficient to virtually force countries to ab abandon very quickly all efforts at sure. clean coal and, and all of these Because other they're desperate sorts of to things. have the energy. The, having, having cheap energy is, will be more important to them and having having more economic activity will be more important to them than any argument about future climate change. So you'd be saying that we need to be thinking much more broadly, mm -hmm. the whole big picture, right. climate change on all of the fossil fuels. Now, now see, the, 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 the energy shortage argument could work to the advantage of the climate change folks if they, if they integrate it into their argument, if they say, look, yes, implementing these kinds of carbon reduction strategies will, in fact, be painful economically, because that, that's the fact of the matter. I mean, that's been downplayed. Yeah, a carbon tax or whatever. It's, yes, it's going to be sure. painful. But ultimately, there is no alternative. We have to get off fossil fuels, mm -hmm. no matter how painful it is, because if we, if, we, uh, if we don't take proactive measures to do that, what will happen is that peak oil, peak natural gas, peak coal will catch up to us. And if we're not prepared, if we're, if we're more reliant on those fuels than we are currently, uh, or even if we, we continue to be as reliant in the future as we are now, that will be an uh, economic catastrophe in and of itself. That'll be even worse. It'll be even worse. So the, fundamentally, the, the two arguments should, should work together. And uh, I, I think it's really a, a shame that, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the sort of the, the peak oil message has been kind of crowded out of the discussion over the last few months. I think that's going to change as time goes on because as, as we start to see the higher prices and the supply shortfalls, then people's attention will, will go back in that direction. Is there anything that folks can do to, because we know it's not going to be painful and it's not something any politician wants to sign up to work on, you know, are we just sort of helplessly sitting here bystanding, you know, waiting for them to move? What mm -hmm. can folks do in any way, I mean, certainly prepare themselves, but pressure Washington, or are we oh, just absolutely. waiting until somebody sort of starts to see the light, yeah, in we, addition to Roscoe Bartlett? Right, right. We have to pressure government at every level, not just Washington. Obviously, there's a lot that needs to happen at Washington, and there, there are some efforts that can only happen at the national level. For example, if we're going to have a rational uh, rationing scheme, which we, we need, we, yeah. uh, as, as prices go up, uh, we, we're going to have to ration gasoline and, and heating oil and all of these, these other things. Um, if we don't do it with some kind of quota system, then prices will, in effect, be a rationing system themselves, but a very inefficient one, and, and it will hit poor people yes. uh, very badly. Uh, so those th kinds of things can only be done at the national level, but there's a great deal that can be done at the state and local level, and we're seeing more and more of those efforts. Um, I'm on the uh, Oil Independent Oakland uh, City Task Force, and, and we're meeting to uh, see what kind of uh, proposals we can design for the city council and mayor of, of mm -hmm. Oakland, California, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. enable that city to dramatically its, reduce its reliance on oil. And uh, in in process of doing that, we're very closely studying a report from Portland, Oregon, that was done just a couple of months ago. Excellent report from the Citizens Task Force. That's there? that's right. Yeah, yeah. And so these are only two two examples, but communities around the country and increasingly around the world are starting to take this very seriously, 
uh, in Britain. There's the, the whole transition town movement yeah. that Rob Hopkins got going uh, a number of months ago, and it's just taking off like wildfire. We don't hear about it very much here in North America, but uh, I'm just going over to uh, England next week to speak uh, to transition town Stroud. <clears throat> so the towns are planning their transitions out of the fossil fuels, or out of petroleum That's at least. Right. And, and they're, they're looking at this as an enormous opportunity to relocalize their economic activity, to uh, recreate their, their local economies, local agriculture, local manufacturing. They're, they're, they're looking at it as uh, almo almost a, a, a party. You know? I mean, this is the, the party's over. Well, in some cases, it's yeah. A but it's, it's a, a new party. It's a new party. party. Different the kind of party. The folks that we just got back from a, a relocalization um, networking group here in, in Northern California, and a lot of communities are jumping on to you know, eat local, buy local, think local, and there's this uh, invigoration. Local music, local yes. arts, yes. Uh, and, and people love Local that. food. Yeah, I mean, the local exactly. food movement is getting very strong yeah. because people are enjoying well, that. There, there, there's a, obviously a, a kind of depressing message attached to peak oil, climate change, all of this. But if we really want to enlist people's creativity, we also have to look at the bright side. We have to look at yeah. what can be gained by promoting local economic activity, by, by working together as communities to find creative solutions to our, our energy dependence. And enjoy ourselves yeah, while we're at absolutely. it. Absolutely. That's, because that's part of the dance. Here we are. In our last minute. Let's make the most of it. When do you think we're going to have oil peaking? Well, I think for regular conventional oil, we're probably already there. Mm -hmm. The statistics seem to be lining up around uh, the peak having occurred in May 2005 for regular crude oil. Okay. We're still seeing marginal growth in all liquids, which includes natural gas liquids and all this uh, biofuels and so on. But that's not likely to continue for long. I, I, I think we're still on track for a peak by 2010 for all liquids. Thank you. We'll see how it goes in three years. <laughs> yes. You're watching Peak Moment, community responses for a changing energy future. I'm Janae Donaldson. Join us next time.